1514, Leonardo was in Rome. This was almost the last stage of his journeying. He spent three difficult years under the patronage of Pope Leo X. There was no natural affinity between the two men. Leonardo devoted his time principally to scientific experimentation. As regards Leonardo learning or plagiarizing other people's techniques and ideas, there was a tradition of artist engineers, in Italy especially, going back for two centuries. And he was particularly influenced by uh, men such as uh, Francesco di Giorgio Martini and Giuliano de Sangallo. I think it's fairer to see him as part of a, a tradition which he exploited using his knowledge of both classical and modern, that is to say, in his own time, modern technologies and understandings. Throughout his life, Leonardo had been interested in mechanical science. His familiarity with machinery had begun in Verrocchio's workshops. A fascination with machines of all types is evident in his analytical drawings of their component parts. Leonardo not only classified the different parts, but also specified their potential functions. His sketches show numerous reproductions of gear systems. Leonardo recognized that, if used appropriately, gears were a potential source of functional power. Gears, cogs and weights are central to many of Leonardo's inventions. What characterizes his engineering drawings is a sense of how a complex system can work in three dimensions. And I think in his mind, he could, in a sense, see the parts moving. Um, and that's the quality of his engineering. So he brought his abilities to understand things in space, movement in space, which you see in all his drawings. He brought it to engineering. The detailed plans Leonardo drew for all his inventions have allowed 20th century engineers to assess their potential. His ingenious design for a spring-driven car shows clearly that it would have been capable of limited forward movement. I think many of his other inventions were probably more speculative. I think he enjoyed playing with ideas and there were loads and loads of pictures of sketches of, of designs which were possibly never used. Uh, um, but uh, he didn't stop him. Because that's the way designers work. They, they will produce loads and loads of sketches of things, um, not expecting them to be used because they're developing ideas and developing principles. But we don't quite know exactly how many of things might have been used because we haven't got all that he, he produced. Uh, the evidence was that he was far more prolific than the, even the small amount that we've got indicates. In pursuit of the precision he valued, Leonardo designed measuring devices. These included an odometer, an instrument to calculate distances. In order to measure time more effectively, he designed a clock with separate movements for minutes and hours. The clock was powered by gears and weight-driven mechanisms. Many people were beginning to experiment with the idea of using a spring. Now, the difficulty with a spring is that when you wind it up, it, it will have its maximum force when it's fully wound. And as it unwinds, the force available goes down exactly in proportion to the amount of time it spends. So what Leonardo devised was a, a way in which, as the force went down from the spring, so he applied the lever principle or gearbox principle to multiply it back up again. Leonardo believed that the key to accurate representation was acute observation. His conviction that vision was the most vital function led Leonardo deeply into the study of optics. He was familiar with the construction and function of lenses. His notes reveal the intensity of his study. Leonardo has been credited with the invention of the camera obscura. He understood that images were reversed on the human retina. There are indications in his notes that he experimented with simple photography. For a man of genius who was obsessed with the faithful reproduction of appearance, photography must have been a logical progression. One of the theories advanced to explain the mystery of the controversial Turin shroud involves Leonardo. It is claimed that he faked the shroud using a photographic image of a decapitated head. 
During his three year stay in Rome, Leonardo had used dissection in order to pursue his studies of the human form. He dissected bodies in the Roman hospital. This work was to end when he was accused of sacrilege. Now, he had some German mirror makers working in his workshop who were making mirrors for him and doing various technological jobs, and these gave him a lot of trouble. They wouldn't learn German. They went off shooting with the Swiss guards and didn't do their work. In retaliation, it seems, the German mirror makers said to the Pope, Leonardo is dissecting illegally. We don't know the result of this, but there's no evidence that Leonardo got into trouble for the dissections he did. In 1516, Leonardo entered the service of his last and best patron. The new ruler of France, King Francis I, invited Leonardo to make his home at the Chateau de Clou. Francis offered him the biggest salary that was then available anywhere in Europe for an artist, an engineer, an architect, for being in the court. And he also offered him accommodation in a manor house, a very gracious residence. So I think Leonardo went because of the opportunity. The king made no demands on a man he saw as the intellectual and artistic giant of the age. He simply wanted the pleasure of Leonardo's conversation. The king gave Leonardo a home, a pension, and peace. Leonardo lived contentedly at Clou and died there in 1519. This most complex genius of the Renaissance belongs to the history of the human mind. Leonardo towered above his contemporaries. His true genius lay in the proficiency he achieved in a diverse range of highly specialized areas. He understood, more clearly than anyone of his century, the importance of precise observations. Leonardo's endless search for knowledge was both his triumph and his tragedy. He failed to complete artistic projects when other avenues of study opened up. His notes were never made public in his lifetime, and his discoveries lay hidden for centuries. Leonardo was a man ahead of his time. His unique, detailed approach to science and art was a mark of his true genius. The quality of his painting and drawing has endured throughout the centuries. If you regard genius as the ability to, to innovate, to think on far wider parameters than any of your contemporaries, uh, to essentially have a leap of the imagination beyond anyone around you, then yes, he was a genius. It is truly remarkable that an essentially self-taught person, without any claim to a formal education, could have accomplished so much in so many disparate fields in a single lifetime. No one had a broader feeling for the complete texture of the world and human beings as dynamic living systems and could express that in visual form. And I think the great genius lies in the drawings and the notebooks and in this vision. No one had a greater sense as to how the visual medium drawing could convey this vision of universal science, of universal knowledge. When Leonardo died, his friend Francesco Melzi wrote, the loss of such a man is mourned by all because it is not in the power of nature to create another such.